And what kinds of issues do you think a citizen has a right or even an obligation to be civilly disobedient to the government? The first distinction you have to draw, of course, between a legitimate and an illegitimate regime. If you're in Nazi Germany or Stalin's Soviet Union, then you have no obligation to obey the laws. The only reason you might do so or seem to do so is out of prudence. But if you live in a democratic, self-governing society, it seems to me it's a pretty high bar to clear. The issue has to be one of paramount importance, and it also has to be so urgent that you cannot wait for the normal mechanisms of policy debate and legislative change to operate. You can't say, well, I'm going to engage in civil disobedience because I couldn't possibly get this done the normal way. You don't have rights to say, my views are so important that we can't let democracy operate if I don't get what I want. You have to be in a situation where you think that something's going on that is so bad that there's a real violation of natural justice to have it continue. And I think it's also very important, and this seems to be very much lost sight of, that the normal course of civil disobedience of a Gandhi or Martin Luther King is that you say the law is unjust, you break the law, and then you take the punishment and you challenge people, citizens and also those in power, to say, do you really feel right punishing me, jailing me for the things that I did, or do you see now that the law needs to change? Whereas nowadays, people do things like blockade railroads or occupy buildings or, or public spaces, expecting not to be punished, that they simply get to override the will of their fellows and the parliamentary or congressional system just because they're them and you're not. That's completely legitimate. I, th I think that there's there's far less occasion for where it's legitimate at all. But it's something like Martin Luther King said, segregation is so wrong that we must dramatize it, but not by thinking we can break the law and get away with it, but by saying the law is unjust, we refuse to obey it, but we'll take the punishment. Will you inflict the punishment, or will you realize that you're being villains if you do so? Martin Luther King went to jail, and he wrote his very famous letter from a Birmingham jail, but the people who blockade, if the police were to show up and arrest them and charge them and put them in jail, according to the statutes, they'd be stunned and they'd be outraged. They think they're sort of morally superior beings to whom the law does not apply for the most part. You find the legislators in these protests, people who make the laws, are taking part in protests against the laws and expecting to break the law and not have any consequences. And that's a totally different thing. That's just sort of declaring anarchy when I feel like it. And these are generally people that everybody else to do what they say. If there's a rule they like, they expect it to be enforced vigorously. But if there's a rule they don't like, they think they can ignore it. But what they're not willing to do is say, fine, put me in jail and see if your conscience gnaws at you. Which is what Martin Luther King was doing, was saying, will you really put a man in jail for saying that all men are created equal? And ultimately, of course, Americans and American authorities, for the most part, decided that they couldn't do that. But he did it by taking the punishment, uncomplaining. Whereas these blockaders, the British to Caledonia, what consequences were there for any of them? If the police had come and killed them all in jail, they wouldn't have said, great, now we'll write letters. They'd have said, this is intolerable. See, I find this really interesting that you went straight there to the ones that were illegitimate because I was talking to a University of Calgary law professor. I said, what sort of spectrum of, of people do you think that it's justified to do this? And she said, especially with traditionally, historically disadvantaged groups, so indigenous and et cetera, et cetera. And uh, I'm not certainly not arguing with you on this one, but it, it sort of seems a bit like we're almost in a culture war where you've got the other side that is saying we need to overthrow what Canada was and is and, and who it was for. And another side saying, look, our rights are getting trampled and we, on our livelihoods and we need to defend them. And so it just occurs to me we're on dangerous ground in a cultural divide. Well, I do think that's true. But one of the things that's odd about it is if you look at the condition of, of Aboriginals and other groups in Canada now compared to, say, 40 or 50 years ago, the idea that they are now oppressed, that they are now treated as less than full citizens, they are now denied their rights to the point where they really aren't bound to obey the laws, as opposed to saying, wow, it's amazing how much the place has changed in 40 years. It's extraordinary how effective their campaign for recognition and decent treatment has succeeded. 
But if it's true of Canada's the kind of place that can be reformed and has been, there's now a great deal of jurisprudence and political sympathy and popular sympathy for Aboriginal causes, then they don't need to break the law. Because the law no longer, I mean, there's a time when the law didn't let Aboriginals vote. And if a system doesn't let you vote, I think that you can fairly say, I'm not really bound by its laws. Um, I may again do the Martin Luther King thing, this difference between armed revolt and this peaceful you know, resistance where if you're arrested, you say, okay, fine, I'll go to jail for saying I should be allowed to vote. And will you really put me there? But the idea that the Aboriginals today are so despised and mistreated socially and legally that they are released to obedience to laws that the rest of us are obliged to obey just seems to me very odd. I would have thought the last 40 years was proof that the system does work, not proof that it doesn't. And I think people are just, they're petulant and they're also very self-centered. They have this sort of Boromir argument. It could have been mine. It should be mine. Give it to me. And it, they don't get much beyond that. You've asked them, what happens if everybody decides they don't have to obey the law? Their answer is, oh, but people do have to obey the law if we like the law. There's no question of you, white people, not having to obey the law. Um, <laughs> But it, like, if, we, if we don't feel like obeying the law, we don't have to because we're us and you're you. But the, the idea, again, that any racial minority in Canada is being badly treated now compared to 30 years ago, that this whole Black Lives Matter and emphasis on gender and all these kinds of things, there is a huge popular political and governmental sympathy. There's enormous legislative accommodation of these things. And so to suggest that they can't get what they want through the law, it strikes me as, as, as fatuous, but also as in some petty kind of way tyrannical. This idea that no matter what happens, they don't have to play by the same rules as everybody else. That's not how a society functions. And again, if they were really being excluded, denied the right to vote, subject to extra legal violence and lynching and stuff, then sure, they would be compelled to do what everybody else is compelled to do. But they're not. That's just that's, that's a bizarre fantasy in terms of Canada in 2020. Understood. Now, when you talk about when there's legislative processes, you don't need to do this kind of civil disobedience. Do you think that because parliaments aren't sitting, legislatures aren't sitting, and we've got almost rule by decree by medical health officers in this time of COVID, that this is just precisely the time where in what was supposed to be a democracy, there needs to be civil disobedience? Well, I think that there is increasingly scope for that, for people simply to say, I'm going to open my restaurant, and if the police come, I won't resist them. I will submit to arrest. They can close the place down, destroy my livelihood, and I will sit in jail. But I will say that this was done to me without my consent and without the use of the system that has served us so well for the better part of 800 years. I don't know that we're there yet, and I don't think I'd do it, because I think the system still can accommodate. Uh, we have panicked, and we've gone overboard, and people have put up with too much, and the politicians are too full of themselves. But that happens a lot. People shouldn't have illusions about government. This is not an unusual situation, except why? happening and it's supposed to some extent the extent of it but I don't think we're yet in a position to say Parliament has failed. I think we're in a position to say well, they've got to stop doing this. If this goes on for another three or four years where well, we don't have budgets and uh, Parliament doesn't sit and it doesn't matter whether you have a majority or not, then we may be in a situation where more and more people have to do that. But again, I emphasize peacefully to say I don't consent to obey this law, but I will not resist the rest. You can put me in jail and I won't break out. I will simply continue to insist that you are wrong, and that if you let me out, I'm going to reopen my restaurant if it hasn't burned to the ground, I'm taken over a squatter so I don't possess by the government, but I will not comply with these regulations. I think we're getting there because the mechanism of self government is breaking down. We don't really understand it anymore. We don't like it very much, and those in power are perfectly happy not to have restraints on what they do, but that is not how we became prosperous and safe and free. And if we keep going in that direction, we won't be prosperous and safe and free. But we're a long way from living in a dictator. Some people, like Jeffrey Simpson wrote a book about Cartier called The Friendly Dictatorship. Jean Cartier was not a dictator. Was, I think of a kind of breaking down of language and of mental barriers to idiocy to talk like that. And then people said Harper was a dictator and then he was voted out. He's like, oh, that wasn't a dictator. And Trudeau is not a dictator, but he is increasingly ruled by decree that he is an, an elected autocrat. And if that keeps up, yeah, we're going to be in a situation where I think we're going to have to try and do something about it. But for now, what we have to try and do is convince our fellow citizens, first of all, that we need the institutions that have made Canada great. And 
secondly, that we maybe need to have an election in which we replace people who have overstepped the bounds of their authority. And I don't just mean at the federal level, and I'm not thrilled by the alternatives, but we are just a very, very long way from where Martin Luther King was in 1955. And we shouldn't kid ourselves. It's sort of vanity to say, oh, I'm so oppressed. It's like, no, you have just no idea what real oppression looks like. It doesn't mean we should be callous or indifferent to the erosion of our Constitution, that we should be realistic about where we are and where we're not. There's the church in Winnipeg, and the Manitoba government has locked down all these people. It's Christmas time. They don't make money. and then But they're selling alcohol and cannabis. All these people show up at a church, but they're in their cars. No one's even allowed to get out and go to the bathroom. And then the police show up with $20,000 of fines. Yeah, I mean, I think if, if you're being subjected to outrageous treatment by the authorities and you're willing to say, I won't do this, Take me to jail, if you will. At least there's a bathroom there. Um, and I will take whatever punishment you give me, but I will take it with a sneer. And I will complain about it. And I will make it a public issue. I will try and rally people to change the conditions that we're living under. And if need be, to change those in power through peaceful means. And say, I'm, I'm not a bad guy. I'm a perfectly decent and reasonable person who's been made to do unreasonable things by people who are drunk with power and their own self-importance. Um, I think there are circumstances under which, yes, you do have to do that. This, even the thing where the small stores are put in a business and the big box stores can operate. And there's no, it seems to be no good evidence that COVID's being transmitted in florists. So I, I think there's a situation where, where I can understand somebody doing it. But again, it is so important that you, in defying the law, don't seek to evade the punishment. That you simply say, okay, I think the law is wrong and I'm going to dramatize it, but I do live in a self-governing society that's just gotten off, you know, into a situation where we, we're making mistakes and I want to dramatize the mistakes, but I'm not in a position of denying the legitimacy of the state and I'm not going underground. I'm perfectly open about what I'm doing and I will not, you know, run from the police or resist arrest or, you know, try and saw through the bars or anything like that. Yeah. Anything else you want to say about this, John? You know, I want to say people should buy my documentary on Magna Carta because people do not understand the importance of limited government in having a decent society. They, they tend to think limited government is sort of luxury we can indulge in when nothing important is happening. But when when there's a crisis, man, everybody better just do what they're told. And that's not how you fix crises. Uh, I, I make this point about Britain during the First World War. At a point when it wasn't going very well, they had a munitions crisis and with a public scandal over bad shells. And you could easily imagine people saying, "Oh heavens, don't tell the Germans our shells stink." But if you do that, you're going to go into the war. You're going to go through the war with bad shells and lose it. Instead, the prime minister fell, and the problem got fixed. And so we really need to understand that parliaments and free speech and the right to dissent and all that stuff isn't something you do when you don't have a problem. It's something you do when you do have a problem. And we need institutional bulwarks against the impatience of those in power and of the mob. And if we get back to that, we'll be fine. But if we don't, we'll continue to make worse and worse policy blunders and treat people more and more uh, with contempt. And that will be a, a terrible thing to let happen to our once great country. Fundamentally, what happened is that the, the English had a compact with their rulers that their rights would be respected, and bad King John was not keeping the deal. And so English society, from top to bottom, from Stephen Lang to the Archbishop of Canterbury, who actually is the prime mover behind Magna Carta, all the way down to the nameless knights who fought in the little and big battles that defeated the king, uh, insisted that the English would not be governed without their consent. And then this led to the development of Parliament, and uh, the Pope nullified it, but Langton, who had previously you know, defined the king on behalf of the Pope, when the Pope um, excommunicated the barons, Langton refused to read out the excommunication, and so he was once again chased out of England, once by the king, once by the Pope, but he didn't, it didn't stop him. He was a man of courage and of principle to whom we owe a great debt. And to all those who made sure, or they fought both literally and figuratively, to see to it that we decided who would govern us and how they would do it. And this was done through appalling crises. And there's no excuse for thinking that things are so bad now, or times are so special, that what worked for 800 years, what won us the world wars, what got women the vote, what produced an astonishing degree of prosperity and eventually proper attention to racial justice, has suddenly just become something foolish and antiquarian. This, this kind of thinking, you know, a dictator dissolves the hills and it doesn't work. Klaus Schwab, he just said with the Great Reset that we need a new social contract. And it's almost like the World Economic Forum wants to 
have themselves be the rulers. I mean, I thought the social contract was where we put government in place, and they're almost claiming the place of government as sort of our economic overlords. Is it time to resist any steps towards that? And again, I think it's important, if you think back to Magna Carta and bad King John, he didn't get up in the morning thinking, how can I oppress my citizens and make them wretched? He got up thinking, how can I make all these idiots do what they're supposed to? And he was a hardworking, intelligent, uh, industrious, and well-organized man with big plans. But they were big plans that didn't uh, acknowledge that in the long run, it was the, the common people had a right to live under conditions they had consented to, and that's why he failed. And I think the one economic form is the same way. These are intelligent, talented people who've got a vision, and they don't understand that if you don't let people say no to things that are really not working for them, you're going to wind up thinking you're doing it right when you're actually doing it wrong, and pride is the sin that attacks us where we're strong. These people are being misled not by their weaknesses, except vanity, uh, but by their strengths into thinking they can do things they cannot do, including no better than us what is good for us. And that is a very old temptation. People think this is new and modern. We've come up with a new idea. Let's have, you know, the big wigs tell all the peasants what to do. It's like, oh, we never heard of that before. Um, but, of course, that thing, that thing is, and it's how most of the world was run most of the time, which is why the English-speaking world was a better place to live. And it's why the English-speaking world was more powerful. John Quincy Adams, in his first uh, message to Congress, he, one of the things he said is that liberty is power. And we forget this at our peril. But liberty is also prosperity, and liberty is decency, and liberty is justice. Without liberty, we will have none of these things, even if we have well-meaning, intelligent, capable people in power. And we just need to recover that. Say to these guys in the World Economic Forum, you've got enough to do running your company, write a book. But no, you cannot discard the popular veto on law and regulation and governance. That won't work, and we won't let you do it. Man, that's brilliant. John, you're a, just a wealth of knowledge and insight. Thank you. Well, my pleasure. <laughs> <laughs> I mean that sincerely.